We're watching out for you. This is First News 3 at 4 with Beth Fisher and Kendall Tenney. Good afternoon. The new leader for the Animal Foundation doesn't have previous experience in shelters, but Christine Robinson says that won't be a problem. Robinson is the group's new executive director and will oversee the lead animal shelter. She'll leave behind her 13-year career with Clark County and her five-month stint as assistant county manager. News 3's Marie Mortera sat down with Robinson today and talked about the challenging road ahead. I, I really She's known for fixing the county's air quality problems. Now Christine Robinson faces a new obstacle. I'm helping uh, a, a sometimes floundering organizations um, move along is it's it's challenging um, but it, it absolutely can be done. She's talking about the Animal Foundation, the nonprofit group that runs the lead animal shelter. While Robinson admits she hasn't worked with the shelter before, she believes her management experience will help her take the helm as executive director April 1st. My career has been spent um, building partnerships with community members to solve large complex community challenges and certainly this falls in that category. The shelter was placed under scrutiny last month when more than 1,000 animals were put down after a deadly outbreak. The criticisms haven't stopped since, especially from animal advocates like Kathy Scott, and today is no different with news of the new hire. I think you need somebody who's going to run a shelter. I think they need shelter experience with animals, don't you? Her advice to the foundation, look elsewhere. But nearby, we found adoptees welcoming Robinson in. Hey, we've already seen what went on here. I mean... What would it hurt to see, you know, to a change. give it a chance? That's what Robinson is counting on. In addition to more accountability and transparency, a big part of her so-called major change plan relies on the public. It will take the whole community. I mean, pet overpopulation is a, a community challenge. Marie Mortera, News 3. Before Robinson, there was no single executive director position. Diane Orgel, the current president of the board, filled that role along with her board duties. Orgel will continue in her role as board director and is working on the next hire, a new director of animal operations. Three people driving the same car are dead after an accident in Henderson this morning. Henderson police say the white car carrying four people pulled in front of a white SUV on Horizon Ridge. They say the driver of the SUV tried to stop but T-boned the car. Two people in that car died at the scene. A third was taken to the hospital where she later died. The fourth passenger was also taken to the hospital along with the driver of the SUV. Police say it's accidents like these where they want to remind people to take driving seriously. Get off the cell phone, take your time, look both ways when you cross the street. It sounds very simple, but that's what's going to keep you alive. Police say it appears alcohol was not a factor in this crash. An appellate court has ordered a Metro police officer to stand trial for charges he used excessive force on a hotel casino guest. The incident happened at the Las Vegas Club in November of 2001. This surveillance video shows Frankie Davis being arrested by Officer David Miller. Davis says the officer slammed his head against a wall, fracturing his neck, and then the officer, according to him, uh, pinned him face down on the floor. Three years ago, a local judge dismissed the charge against Miller. Davis appealed, and earlier this week, the Ninth U.S. Court of Appeals reversed the decision, stating Miller's force was extremely severe and that, quote, a reasonable juror could find his decision was not merely an exercise or abuse of discretion, but instead a willful disregard for the law. It gets to go to the jury. Yeah. You know, based on, on what this guy's conduct was, basically. Yeah. They can't just wipe it underneath the rug and uh, essentially condone it. Officer Miller was put on administrative leave for a short time after the incident. He has been back on the force since that time. His attorney was not available for comment and a trial date hasn't been set yet. Disbelief and dismay across the southeast today as residents and communities across two states pick up the pieces from the deadly twisters that tore through Thursday night. Eight students were killed at a high school in rural Alabama. Jake Gray has the latest from that school. In less than a minute. No. 15 seconds is over. No. Lives changed forever. It was the most terrifying moment, I think, for any of them. And I don't know that they will get over this anytime soon. And lives lost. Hasn't quite hit me quite yet. I'm still in shock, I guess. A string of tornadoes ripped across the Deep South. More than two dozen killed in Georgia and Alabama. 
one of the hardest hits at this high school in Enterprise, where eight students were trapped and killed. And we're struggling, we're numb. This is not anything that we ever imagined would happen. No one could have imagined all of this. If you look, look down the street and all, I mean, it, it's just devastating, just devastating. In the tiny towns across this region, pulling together has always been a way of life. Tragedies like this one only seem to strengthen those bonds. A house can always be rebuilt, but a life can't. Thousands are now struggling to clean up, many with living rooms, no longer a place to gather, exposed to the world, but a reminder that they are still living, and despite appearances, the fortunate ones here. Just hold on and hope for the best, and God look after us. <laughs> Survivors struggling to deal with lives shattered and so many lost. Jay Gray, NBC News, Enterprise, Alabama. Oh, it's horrible to see. And Dana Wagner has been following this storm. He joins us now in the News 3 Weather Center. Dana, we hope no more pictures like that coming out of Alabama anytime soon. Yeah, well, that is the good news here. It looks like they are really clearing out in the southeast. These are the line of storms that moved through yesterday and uh, during the evening hours last night, and now they have moved out into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we may have seen some of these pictures already, but uh, they bear repeating. Let's show you some of those uh, pictures from Alabama. These were taken from a cell phone. And you can see that large funnel there. That's the tornado, of course, as it moved through uh, Enterprise, Alabama during the day yesterday, creating all the problems there. And uh, it was a monster tornado. And the good news is, uh, at least according to our future cast, everything is moving out into the ocean and the southeast should be clear for the weekend. So uh, no more storms on the way. As uh, far as our weather is concerned around here, lots of sunshine, little bit of wind to deal with, like 10 to 20. What you saw today is what you're going to see tomorrow. Lots of sunshine, winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. We're going to top out into the lower 60s tomorrow for highs. We'll talk about your longer range outlook coming up in a few minutes. Dana, thank you. More ramp closures on US 95 are confusing drivers. Tom Holly joins us from Sky 3 to help us sort it all out. Yeah, you just got to keep a scorecard at home if you can to know what's closed and what's open or go up to the KVBC website and follow the links to NDOT. And we'll show you what's happening here right now where you have the closure of the entrance ramp from Valley View onto 95, but you can just use Decatur instead. Of course, for the exit from 95, the Decatur ramp is closed. You can use Valley View instead. And that'll remain the case for the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Uh, that's going to be a big problem. And in the meantime, through March 25th, just switch them around, use the other ramps. And this is all part of the widening, of course. They're improving this area on the north side of the freeway, going up to the sound wall in between the two ramps. About uh, four more week, weeks worth of work to be done here. And, of course, the project as a whole ends at the end of this year. Lots of ramp closures to tell you about. More to come. We'll keep you abreast. Tom Bolling reporting from Sky 3. Thank you, Tom. The kids' first team is always watching out for the safety of their children, and uh, today we have a story that we first told you about a month ago, and it's getting some results that parents say will make their children safer. By Monday morning, Beckley Elementary School will get its school zone back. The county had turned off the flashers at Desert Inn and Pecos in December, saying the lights were no longer needed, but parents complained without the school zone, cars weren't slowing down for the students. People are not even aware there's a school here, there's no signage. They're going on this 7th Street arterial at 70 miles an hour, not watching for the kids. There's a group of people working hard to make sure kids get to and from school safely, and they well helped work on the situation at Beckley. We told you about the group before. They're called Lookout Kids About. This is video of their kickoff in August. The coalition is made up of parents, public officials, district leaders, and law enforcement. If you'd like more information, just head to the Kids First section of our website at kvbc.com. A Henderson family is expecting a big delivery soon. They have quadruplets on the way, and the Healthline 3 team is following their pregnancy. Today, we wanted to introduce you to the expanding Cummings family. I want to be a big sister, like a hero. Nine-year-old Sierra Cummings is preparing for a major arrival. Her mom, Sabrina, is expecting four babies, two boys, two girls. Sierra is eager to help. I'm going to babysit. Micah and Brooke. Yeah? Why those two? Because those are my favorite. Sabrina and her husband, Kurt, had been trying to have another child for six years. At first, they were told they had triplets on the way, but they were in for another surprise. The doctor said, 
like, oh, did they tell you? And I was like, no. And they were like, oh, there's four instead of three. And we were shocked. We were like looking at each other like, what are you talking about? Are you joking? The Cummings had just moved to Las Vegas when they heard the news. Their family lives in Hawaii. They keep them updated with a special website. Sabrina has been in and out of Sunrise Hospital. She's excited but worried about the babies and making ends meet. We're already concerned about, you know, how we're going to, you know, raise three babies. And when they said four, like, all I could see was, like, car seats, money, bottles, diapers. Like, and I was just, you know, how are we going to do it? Big sister Sierra is ready to do her part by sharing her room. And she doesn't seem worried about missing out on sleep. But I'm kind of a heavy sleeper, so they can't wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> Sabrina is 24 weeks pregnant right now. She will deliver at Sunrise Hospital hopefully sometime in April, and we're hoping the Healthline 3 team will be able to be there for part of it anyway. And just one reminder to you, this is four babies coming into one family at one time, and they really could use your help. If anybody out there can help this family with car seats, cribs, all the gear, maybe a store could sponsor them, we would be so grateful. <laughs> And lots of patience yes. as well. Yeah, we wish them the best. There are a lot of things, important things to consider when you go on a job interview. One of the most important things is what you wear. But many women of Shade Tree Shelter don't have the benefit of having the right clothes to put on for an interview, and that's where you could help. Town Square Las Vegas and the Shade Tree Shelter are joining forces asking working women to, quote, give up your suit. The drive goes on until next Friday. You can drop off a new or gently used suit at the Shea Tree Shelter on the corner of Owens and Main from 9 until 4. The suits go to benefit women who graduate from the Shade Tree's job development program. A bus carrying college baseball players plunges off an interstate overpass. This is something that's not going to leave the guys who are on that bus this morning. Um, this is going to be with us forever. How many of the players were killed and what one of the surviving members revealed about the moments following the accident. Plus, Anna Nicole Smith is finally laid to rest. Or is she? What her mother is asking a judge in the Bahamas to do now. I was trying to stop the car and he didn't let me and I, that, that's why I smacked him on the head with my book. How this little girl helped save the day when a carjacker took off with her mother's car. Coming up. Thank you for making us your number one newscast at 4 o'clock. This is First News 3 at 4. charter bus carrying a college baseball team plunged over an Atlanta interstate overpass this morning, killing six and critically injuring at least nine others. Police say the driver may have been confused about where the lanes split for an exit. Here you can uh, see the aftermath of the accident. Authorities and eyewitnesses said the bus exited I-75 South in a high occupancy vehicle or HOV lane leading to a bridge and uh, it did not stop at the top of the ramp and plunged off the overpass. Officials say 35 people were on the bus at the time, and this is uh, animation of what took place. The team's second baseman, who has a broken collarbone and other injuries, described the crash. I woke up as soon as the bus hit the uh, overpass's wall, and that's when I looked up, and the bus landed on the left side, which is the side I was sitting on, and I just looked out and saw the the uh, road coming up after me and it's just that's all his brother was on that bus too and pinned under, underneath the bus for a long time and, and went to the hospital six killed included uh, four members of Bluffton University's baseball team the bus driver and the driver's wife the bus was on its way to Fort Myers Florida for a tournament She's traveling the country with her son in a bright pink RV, and though they joke this trip may end with one of them walking home, they're sharing the small space for a big cause. Gail Zinda is a lung cancer survivor, and her best friend died of breast cancer. She's driving across the country in this bright pink RV to educate people about both diseases. Zinda says she's lucky to be alive. She had no symptoms except one dizzy spell, and that's how doctors found her lung cancer. We decided to travel the country and just 
talk to everybody that will listen to us and help raise the awareness about lung cancer and that people shouldn't have to die from this disease and too many do and we need to raise awareness about it. Zinda smoked in her 20s but wasn't diagnosed with lung cancer until she was 50. She'll continue taking her message around the country for one year and she's also written a book about it all called Pink Lemonade. Anna Nicole Smith was buried today, but Alicia Jacobs joins us to tell us how the battle over her body still is not over. Exactly, Kendall. More than three weeks after her death, Anna Nicole Smith was buried in the Bahamas next to her son today. But after weeks of fighting and legal wrangling, even her funeral had its share of drama. It was reality TV, as only Anna Nicole could provide. A funeral that literally went down to the wire. For half an hour, the funeral procession sat, stopped, just shy of the church, as attorneys for Anna's mother rushed to a Bahamian court, demanding the whole process be halted. In the end, the judge denied Virgie Arthur's request. And she was greeted by cheers and jeers for her daughter's funeral. A star-studded affair that featured some of Anna's favorite things, the color pink, flowers and hundreds of cameras. It was almost surreal. Outside, you know, you saw the cameras and the red carpet, but inside it was actually a really beautiful, sweet tribute to Anna Nicole Smith. The man who ultimately chose where Anna would be buried, court-appointed guardian Richard Milstein, made a statement for the media. I'm asking all of you, the public, the media, of all, to write a final chapter to this great tragedy with me. But as Anna Nicole was buried in a private ceremony next to her son Daniel, the final chapter may be far from written. Daniel's father is asking a Bahamian court to exhume and move Daniel's body. Arthur's attorneys may still fight to move Anna Nicole. And ex-boyfriend Larry Burkhead and companion Howard K. Stern are still battling over the daughter she left behind. Not to mention the half billion dollars she could inherit. Even as mourners said their goodbyes, it seems there are questions over whether Anna Nicole has truly been laid to rest. Well, people who were inside the church said Howard K. Stern got up and criticized so-called family members who tried to stop today's funeral and then promised Anna he would take care of their daughter, Danny Lynn. Meantime, a hearing is now set for Tuesday for the request to exhume Daniel Smith. And on March 16th, there will be another custody hearing. So the funeral is over, but it seems the fight is far from finished. Back to you guys. Has anybody in that whole circus heard of rest in peace? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Just no, leave that, it alone. That, 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 that story is disturbing in many respects. Not disturbing, though. This day, beautiful, Isn't it beautiful nice? day outside. Isn't it nice? It's I great. Was, if, I, if you may, just for, I was going through the paper the other day, and I came across <laughs> this article. I didn't know if you had seen this or not, but it caught my eye. Wagner still in own league. Yeah. Wagner still in own yeah. league. So I, I, um, I don't mean to burst your bubble. What? Uh, but it's talking about Honus Wagner right there. What? Honus Wagner is it's, uh, it's the holy grail of baseball. Oh, cars. yeah, it has nothing. Wow, to do with you. Oh, yeah. you didn't read the fine I, print. No, I just <laughs> saw my name up there and assumed they were talking about me. He already had it me. framed. Yeah. Wow, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> All right, we do have a good weekend out there. In fact, a lot of folks are going to have spring fever. Temperatures are going to be very close to 80 by next week. This weekend into the 60s. Uh, winds are going to calm down some by Sunday. Tomorrow, pretty pretty much the same as what we saw today. Winds out of the north 10 to 20 miles per hour and a current temperature of 59 degrees. Winds are on the low end of that scale right now out of the north 10. I don't think they'll be closer to 20 tonight. I think they'll be closer to the 10, but they'll probably pick up again after sunrise tomorrow. We have lots of sunshine at 58 degrees in the northwest at Centennial Hills. In North Las Vegas, it's also 58. Winds there in the single digits from our Wells Fargo WeatherNet site. East Charleston and Las Vegas Boulevard, lower 60s, winds in the single digits as well. High temps from across the state and beyond. Well, they're starting to warm up in northern Nevada, and that's an indication of what temperatures are going to do here as well. They were at 31 yesterday in Elko and Ely, and they've warmed uh, into the mid-30s at least today. 49 degrees at Reno, 55 at St. George, and Las Vegas. We made it to 60 today. We're on the edge of the clouds. We may even get a little bit of snow in northeastern Nevada. They've had a little bit in Elko. You can see the clouds are right there through central Nevada. Here's why. We have a big ridge of high pressure out in the Pacific Ocean. We're still getting that northerly flow down over the top of the high, and that's giving us the below average temperatures. We're also dealing with a pressure gradient as the 
airflow wants to go from the high to this low, and that's why the breezes picked up a little bit again today, and we're going to have to deal with them a little bit tomorrow as well. But lots of sunshine and warmer temperatures in the forecast. Tonight down to 39 winds, 10 to 20. I think they'll be a little bit closer to the 10 than the 20. Tomorrow we do warm up 3 to 5 degrees, close to 70 at Lake Mead and Laughlin, 63 at Pahrump, 64 at Boulder City. Here in Las Vegas we're looking for a high of 63. I put breezy up there, but it's uh, going to be like it was today, 10 to 20 on the winds. We go from 63 tomorrow to 77 oh. by 3. Thursday. Spring has sprung. Unofficially, of course. Right. I'm going to announce today the unofficial arrival of spring. Wow. Really? Right yes. Can big. I do that? Like John yes. McCain on the Letterman show. Just boom, you sprung right. on us. Yeah, right that, there. that's it. Yeah. Spring is here, my friends. Wow. We you love are, it. you are, my friend, in your own league. <laughs> a league? Of yes, their own. Whether it's a minor league or a major right. league. Oh, has well, yet thank to be you. Determined, I appreciate that. It is your own league. Yeah. Thank you. Still to come, a criminal in Miami got more than he bargained for with this six-year-old. Find out what she used to fight crime and save her family. Still to come. I want to tell you what's coming up on our news at 5 o'clock. A father is venting his frustration with police after his son was shot outside the Mink Strip Club on All-Star Weekend. And he was still at Lucid and able to talk to her. I mean, what an opportunity they missed. We'll tell you what the Tom Orbanski's father thinks police should have done with his son just before he slipped into a coma. Also coming up tonight, police need your help to catch up with this guy, find out the very specific demand he makes when he robs local pharmacies. And an unusual target for a heist, a family robbed at gunpoint for their new puppies. Oh, coming up tonight on News 3 at 5 o'clock. All right, Jim, thanks. We'll see you then. We'll be right back. I want to, I'm sorry, can I start again? I can't put a sentence together. And they gave me a show. Everyone needs a little R&R. &R. Rachel Ray. Weekdays at 11 on Channel 3. A little girl turned into a crime fighter after someone tried to carjack her mom's car. Six-year-old Brianna Diaz was being put into the back seat when a carjacker shoved her mother out of the way and sped off. The mom was hanging on to the door when the suspect threw the car into reverse and pinned the woman against a utility pole. That's when Brianna jumped into action. I was trying to stop the car and he didn't let me and I, that, that's why I smacked him on the head with my book. <laughs> yes, the carjacker let the child go and took off. Mom had a few cuts and scrapes but is otherwise okay. The car was found abandoned but uh, no arrests have been made so far. We'll be right back. So spring is here, huh, Dana? Yeah, officially in three weeks, but I'm declaring the official, the <laughs> unofficial start to spring this weekend. Look at that forecast. We're going to be near, uh, near 80 by the end of next week. This weekend, you're going to like it too, warming temperatures. And, and what's really, you just mentioned during the break, next week is? Daylight saving time. Oh, that's, that's right, wow. next week. We'll see you.